Hello string players! In this video I'm going to talk a little bit about phrasing in solo Bach and I'm going to give you some ideas of how to practice in a way that's going to help your interpretation come across through your performance. My name is Ina Langerman and if you're new to this channel go ahead and subscribe and hit the notification bell that way you don't miss my weekly lesson video to you and also on occasion I'm going to share with you a homemade recording project. Now if you would prefer a short mini bite-sized version of this that's 30 to 60 seconds long or if you would like to listen to me practicing instead then head over to Instagram and follow me at Violina. It's the same spelling as the name of this channel. So in this video, for our example, I'm going to be using Bach's G minor adagio uh, from uh, Bach's solo violin sonata, the first one. And um, I'm going to share with you some ideas that have helped me navigate this music and interpret it. Now, just before we get started, a disclaimer that I do not by any means consider myself a specialist of Baroque music, although I greatly, greatly admire musicians who devote their lives to really dive deep and study this genre. Before you begin practicing, I strongly encourage that you take the score and study it first and identify first where all the phrases are and do some kind of harmonic analysis. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but the reason we're doing this first is to give you a sense of where there is tension and release within each chord and also to give you a sense of hierarchy over the scope of the entire movement first, before you even play anything. So one general rule of thumb that you can follow to help navigate you through this is to highlight dissonances in this piece because um, many times in Baroque music or and even classical music, um, dissonances are used uh, to create harmonic tension and when they result to a consonant that's the release. So the dissonances and consonances and also the horizontal harmonic structure can help guide you to, to um, interpret where the height of each phrase is and where there are peaks and valleys. So looking at this movement we can see right away that many of the dissonant uh, chords are actually uh, um, suspension chords that resolve downwards into the consonant. And let's right away look at the very opening of this, uh, the very opening phrase. So we can see right away um, it's really just a G minor chord, but with all kinds of things happening in the middle there, right? <laughs> So there's our first one, right? So we have this seventh interval on the bottom, A against the G, and the G resolves downward to an F sharp. So, so you want to highlight the G. However, there's another note in this chord, right? We have, once it resolves down to the F sharp, now it creates a tritone with the C above it. So that actually gives me a clue, that tritone, that I should sustain it and keep it going. So as you can see, it's a very prolonged dominant seventh chord, actually. So now, just to keep going, um, let's go to the second phrase, pick up to measure three. Now this one's interesting. The downbeat of measure three, we also have a suspension. We have a 4-3 suspension actually. The perfect fourth in this case is treated like a dissonant interval because we have a 4-3 suspension. The four results, the B flat results down to the A. Now just one thing to keep in mind. Um, as you're going through these. Um, just a small tip, don't make every single dissonant arrival like a big event because you also have to keep in mind the scope of the entire movement and also you know phrase by phrase. So for example here where we just arrived at measure three, just 
a, it's more like a sigh because look, it keeps going. It goes here. Okay, so this one, I feel that this chord is a little more important than the downbeat of three. Just giving you an example. Okay, so this is just a small idea of how to use the harmonies to help guide you. Now, there is one more thing you can do. And it's, so if you, if you scan right away the entire page, you can see how Bach saw the violin as a multi-voiced instrument. So in order to navigate the harmonic structure, one thing you can do that's very, very effective that really helped me is to play just the bass line. So I'm actually going to play just the bass line starting at the pickup to three, so you can hear where we're going. That one is interesting, the going into measure five. Now, you don't want to play the bass line just kind of note by note. I think it's still important that you keep this bass line within the rhythm of the piece. And one way to help you do that is singing the melodic line while playing the bass line. So I'll just demonstrate a little bit. And please excuse my terrible singing. So pick up to measure three. Da 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 da. Bum ba dum ba da da. I'm not gonna sing all those notes. And then next measure. see how this helps me um, do two things. The singing helps me do two things. It helps me hear how the bass line relates to the melody and also um, at the same time this leads to our next um, tip that's going to help you interpret this. So one thing that you probably noticed as I was singing is there was a little bit of rhythmical freedom, but at the same time, the bass line helped me stay grounded um, from beat to beat. So this rhythmical freedom, um, you know, if you look through Bach's manuscript, actually, it even visually looks um, like a, a handwritten improvisation, which is probably what this originally was. He probably just sat down, improvised this and wrote this out. Maybe if you wrote this on a different day, it would have been a little bit different, you know. So, so the main idea is to keep some of that improvisation-like feel while maintaining a pulse of four. Um, sometimes um, this adagio is thought of as a subdivided four, and that's fine. Uh, but I would recommend not to go as so far as to think of it in eight because it's still in common time and also you know in the beginning if you look at the beginning you can see that the chords they they really change on every half note so it definitely gives me a clue to keep it feeling in four so let's go back to the beginning and we'll do one more thing okay so this time um, instead of playing the bass note and singing the melodic line, I'm going to play what's written, but I'm going to walk the pulse. Okay, so as you can see, even with all of these phrases, um, you have to keep moving forward. So doing the walking 
really helps me think not just the hierarchy of each phrase, but it also also gonna help you keep your bow moving. Especially in a piece like this, you have to you have to really imagine it's like water, you know, and water doesn't have any sharp edges or anything like that, you know. So from one section to the next, even even when you arrive in measure 13, you know, the suspenseful um, diminished seventh, we have... So you have to already think about how that's going to connect into the next section. Um, everything is somehow related to each other. Um, so, you know, just to keep it as simple as I can possibly say, keep your bow moving, um, sing in your head as you're playing this. Or you can sing, you can even do the opposite of what we did earlier. You can sing the bass line and play the melody. Maybe that will help you better, you know. Try different things. Okay, so there are so many more things I would like to talk about this movement all on its own. Um, but, you know, if I kept going, this video would be an hour long at least, so I don't want it to be that long. And so because of that, we're going to stop right here. And I hope that these ideas are helpful for you, that it gives you some things to take with you into the practice room to think about. Uh, let me know in the comments below if this was helpful for you. Okay, and if you enjoyed this video, if you found this helpful, uh, don't forget to like this video and share it with a friend or a colleague. Okay, so as always, happy practicing and I will see you next week.